Hello everyone, my name is Thomas. Uh, I'm from uh, Capturing Reality team at Epic Games. I'm a, a technical product manager and uh, I would also like to introduce you to Joe and Ryan. Uh, they are from Metatexel, co-founders, and uh, together we would like to uh, talk more about the beautiful Jump project. And now I would like to hand over to Joe. Thank you, sir. Um, as Thomas mentioned, Ryan and I are from Metatexel. Thank you all for coming today. We're looking forward to diving into uh, what Jump is first and then getting into how we approached uh, scanning a mountain for the world's first hyper-real wingsuit simulator. So let's uh, let's start with what Jump is. And, and to do that, I want to give you guys a little visual aid. Let's dive right in. So as you can see, Jump, jump is a location-based virtual reality experience where you physically do have to jump off of an edge. It's about the height of this stage, what you're, what you're standing in. We call that the jump bay. Um, it starts in an aircraft, so you have to jump out of an aircraft first, so you do a, a wingsuit skydive. Then you land on top of Notch Peak, which is the mountain that we scanned to build the level. Um, then you land down below. That's kind of the high-level... Uh, view of the whole thing, but the the goal of Jump when it started was to create an authentic human flight experience. And I think when you see people reacting like you saw uh, Rodrigo on the previous clip having the uh, expletive uh, comments there as he's approaching the edge, I think we got really, really, really close to an authentic simulation. And our challenge, which was a little bit different than making someone believe they're flying, uh, was uh was it was different like i said right let's 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 get a little bit further into that right now so we wanted to bridge the gap between the virtual and the real and i think this image does a really good job at displaying the virtual and the real the left and the right side of the brain right it started with a a napkin sketch what's funny about this sketch it was drawn about 5 years ago when this project first came up uh, a lot of what you see here actually made it over to the physical simulator product um, which I don't think James, who drew this, thought would happen. Uh, but it did. And, and it started with a black box as well. And in that black box, we had to convince a professional wingsuit athlete, Marshall Miller, the sensation of an exit point, falling, terminal velocity, and human flight. So we had to create a custom helmet for that as well, uh, because if you jump out of an airplane or off of a cliff in a wingsuit, you wear a helmet. So we needed to build a helmet for that. What you just saw there is what we call the catch at jump. And that is absolutely critical to making someone believe that they have jumped off of something. What's interesting about this image, and, and if you notice uh, in later clips in this, the flyer is laying flat. When you jump off of a cliff, you're going straight down, right? What we do in the game is we tilt the world straight down. The player is never going straight down, but the brain is a really interesting uh, organ, right? Like we, if we tell you that you're going straight down, you tend to believe you're going straight down. And that really leans into the authenticity as well. Like I said, we made a custom VR headset and this is basically a valve index that we tore apart, had to preserve the constellation so all the tracking would carry over. That was done by a really amazing partner called Optimal Design out of Chicago. They're just killers when it comes to designing these types of things. So. Custom VR headset was critical to the user experience of this whole thing. And then the jump bay was also critical. Uh, these are you know, early rendition sketches of what uh, we thought the, the bay would look like. But a lot of this carried over, just like the previous slide where the sketch where we were showing kind of what the catch mechanism could be, the jump bay does in reality work just like this. There is a, uh, a glass window that you can look in before the individual jumps and is caught. And then when that jump happens, when the catch happens, that glass transitions to a projection. And we display real-time 
um, a game gameplay, basically, as you're in there. If you're wondering how the simulator functions and how you know somebody is actually controlling where they're going in there, they're basically inside of a motion capture volume. There's six points of tracking. The head, hands, feet, and the back are all tracked constantly. And there's an apparatus up above that is adjusting uh, according to the individual's body movement. So it's not everybody is going to have a first good, ex first ex like flight that is amazing the first time because you got to know how to get your body into the right position. And if you don't, you're going to end up veering off to the left or the right. Getting your head in the right position is is like really the most important thing. We've got someone who just jumped a couple days ago in the audience here, and he can attest to this. I mean, if you look down, you're going to go down into the ground. You got to get your head in the right position. Keep your arms and your legs in the right position. Takes like real core body strength. The guy who wrote the code for the the simulator is actually a professional wingsuit athlete as well. I think we found the only guy in the world who knows how to write. C++ code and jump off of a cliff without dying. Uh, so he's, he's the guy, uh, Hartman Rector is his name, and he's the one who wrote the code. And, and he said that we're like 60% of the way there, you know? And, but that's more than enough for someone to believe that they've jumped off of a cliff. Uh, moving on from there, the first location is open. It's you know, about 20 minutes south of Salt Lake City in Bluffdale, Utah. This functions as corporate headquarters, and there's two jump bays here currently. Um, hopefully more locations will be open soon. The next one's looking like it's going to be in Newark, New Jersey at the American Dream Mall, so keep your, keep your eyes peeled for that. Um, like I said, the user experience here is, is, was a critical thing for James, who's the CEO of Jump, and every single detail was taken into account from getting the wingsuit on to getting the right size of the wingsuit to the individual. All the code that was written to support the actual catch mechanism and, and, and support a flyer as they're you know, jumping out of an airplane and subsequently a, a cliff. Um, here's a little bit more. You know, I talked about authenticity being core to jump, you know, soup to nuts. And uh, I think that we really got there with it. And when we see reactions like this individual, this is Rodrigo again, they're flying. And you get a, this gives you a good demonstration as to how it's actually functioning as well. It's cables and wind. The suspension system uh, is really doing most of the work there. There's a fan in the simulator that gives you some texture, but it does not actually inflate the wings. Feel free, real? Authenticity, realism, all things that we were going for. And I, a moment ago, I mentioned like our challenge was a little bit different. Uh, because we were responsible for building the world. You know, we needed to create an authentic, high-fidelity digital double of a real base jump location. And that had to convince professional athletes that they were getting the same sensation that they do in the real, in the real world. Notch Peak was our subject matter. This is in uh, the western desert of Utah. Um, it is some of the most unforgiving terrain that you could imagine. The closest city is an hour and a half by car. Uh, we based our operation at the closest airport, which was about a 10-minute flight uh, away. But uh, we're going to get more into that in a moment. Some high-level numbers. Um, the world we built consists of over 35,000 photos, medium format photos, very, very, very large data set. Uh, we built a custom camera array that was 1,050 megapixels uh, collectively to pull that off. And we've got over 9 billion polygons running in uh, UE5 at uh, 120 plus frames per second. And the landscape is roughly 10 square miles. That's kind of the high level view of what Jump is. I'm going to hand it over to Thomas so he can tell us what reality capture is. Yeah, thank you so much, Joe. So uh, first, I would like to um, kind, of, kind of emphasize the fact how this was created. This wasn't modeled. Uh, this was done by photogrammetry. Photogrammetry, what, what it basically is, is like, like a really in a simplified way, uh, creation of 3D meshes from 2D pictures. So uh, reality capture is the software uh, which was utilized in this initiative. And uh, with reality capture, you are able to even process this amount of imagery because this isn't something that is like, you know, you cannot use it in different softwares this way. You cannot just ingest this many pictures in this kind of resolution in different softwares. So this is where reality capture excels. And also, 
um, it's all seamless. You can just drag and drop pictures uh, to reality capture, but you can also utilize different kind of inputs. It could be a laser scan, it could be a UEV uh, imagery or a camera rig. Um, then when you have all these data, you just drag and drop it to reality capture. And how the process usually works uh, is that uh, you basically drag and drop everything to reality capture, then go through alignment, which is the registration of cameras and the creation of sparse point cloud. Then you go to meshing. So basically you create the mesh and then you kind of want to optimize it. So uh, you can apply some smoothing tools or uh, you could simplify the model or you can clean it up with filter selection tools. Uh, then you go to UV unwrapping and texturing and then uh, to export. Uh, when you are dealing with really large data sets, you are also using something called component workflow uh, because you want to just uh, make it more efficient and faster. And uh, if you want to learn more about this, we can talk about uh, that after the session because that would be a really long journey. Um, but um, what is also really important is the optimization. So uh, photogrammetry tends to create a really large models. And that's why we have like selection tools and filter selection tools, uh, simplification, and all these tools that I mentioned earlier. Um, but this is a manual process. And in this amount of um, pictures and this, like when the pro project is this huge, uh, you want to automate everything. So uh, we went ahead and automate, uh, we, we really, really had to automate this process uh, using CLI script. And um, I don't want to spoil it, but we had to change a lot. So how we had to actually do it with this amount of imagery, I want to hand over to Ryan to speak more about that. Thanks, Thomas. All right. This is, uh, this is our protagonist. This is our hero of the, the experience, uh, this Notch Peak. Um, we scanned 10 square miles of this. That vertical wall is about uh, 2,200 uh, feet straight down, and that's uh, you know, perfect for the wingsuiters. Uh, not so perfect for us doing scans and getting our teams in there. Uh, to, to capture what we need. That vertical wall actually wraps around uh, like a big bowl. And so it's not, a, a, it's not an easy uh, capture. It's just quickly, that, that is one of the only places in the US where you can legally jump off of a cliff in a wingsuit, by the way, which is very much the reason why we chose that as our first location. Yeah. And you, know, you, you might be looking at this camera rig and going, well, why, why are you killing a mosquito with a sledgehammer? I mean, it, it, it's made up of five uh, 150 megapixel uh, cameras with 50 mil lenses and 300 megapixels with 80 mil lenses. And the idea was that we were gonna use the 50 mil lenses, uh, the data from that to do the, the meshing and reconstruction and use the 80 mil uh, for the texturing. Um, this, this was all inspired by, we saw the initial trailer for UV5 and Nanite. Look at all the detail we can, we can push into that area. Oh my God, billions of poly. Um, it wasn't out yet, but we decided to, you know, try to plan for the future. Let's capture it. You know, we knew the initial launch was gonna be, you know, in 427, but we wanted to get the data to make something great uh, in, in, in Nanite. And uh, it's, it's all about coverage. And so this is the array we made to get that coverage. It's a completely modular system. You can move the cameras around, uh, rotate them, pivot them. And we did that because every capture is kind of a unique snowflake. You always wanna try to plan to whatever the topology is, adjust the camera array, come up with your mission plan to make sure that you're getting the coverage uh, that you need. Um, I've gotten a lot of questions like, why didn't you do drones? Because obviously getting a helicopter in the air is, is, is quite expensive and obviously these, these cameras aren't cheap either. But Going after large-scale environments with a drone, um, you know, after looking at it, getting the drone team out there, the altitude of these uh, of the mountains and the air getting thinner, and just the number of batteries that it would take to go through, it just became not not really feasible. And, and most of all, it would have taken days uh, with with the drones, and the lighting would have changed, and it would just made more more work on the back end for post production for us. So this is this is where we landed. Um, what you're looking at here is the mission plan, uh, which essentially those lines going back and forth, that's the plan for our, our helicopter going back and forth, north, north to south, east to west. And uh, you go in with a plan, like, like 
every project, um, and, and projects, you know, need to change. So that was our plan for the helicopter to go back and forth. The mission plan looks nice and neat and tidy, but that's the, sp <laughs> that's, that's the spaghetti mess we were, we were left with. I just threw spaghetti at the wall. Um, it actually makes sense. Um, if on this slide here, you can see those vertical lines on the, on the left of the uh, uh, screen there, and that was our initial plan. And our helicopter pilot came back and said, no, this, is, this isn't working. We can't, we can't rise in altitude while maintaining the, the camera distance from the subject matter and still having focus. We can't get out of that canyon. We're going to kill ourselves. So we had to come up with another plan. And so that's where you see the uh, left to right mission uh, with, with those verticals. And then we dove in deep and just you know, painted with corkscrews and uh, you know, following the uh, edges of the cliff. To, to get what we needed there. And that inside where the spaghetti is, like that was the most important part for us at jump, yeah. you know, because that's what you're gonna be flying right next to. So that detail was absolutely critical for us to get. Yeah, couldn't, couldn't miss that part. Also the level of detail, because when you are basically creating larger overlap, you're also increasing the resolution for that part. And that was really crucial because that was basically where the jump bay is when you are just flying through, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is the capture rig on the, on the helicopter. It's attached to the uh, front down post uh, just underneath the belly pan there. All the cameras are powered by the helicopter. Um, we've got an Aplanix system in there. Those uh, recording boxes are uh, hot swappable drives. It's recording all the data as we're flying. There's the Aplanix. And then there's the monitors. And what I like about this system is it allowed us to qualify the data as we were going. So we were getting tack sharp imagery. You know, we could zoom in while we were going to make sure that the imagery was tack sharp. Uh, and, uh, you know, obviously you're, you're burning jet fuel. You don't want to be uh, coming back with bad data. That's for sure. Uh, no, no gimbal. There's a bit of stabilization in that circular uh, contraption underneath. Once we got all the images back from that, then, then you move into the alignment phase uh, with, with Reality Capture, dealing with uh, all the images. We had started with about 54,000 images, but then we ended up culling about 19,000, just getting rid of the, the helicopter banking, getting rid of shots that maybe clipped a bit of the sky, and we you know, didn't want that uh, for Reality Capture. Um, but the Aplanix data that we got was, was kind of mission critical, uh, well, for, for, for the alignment phase because we, we had very accurate GPS. And along with the GPS, we were also able to calculate the EOs, which is the orientation of those, of those cameras. And uh, when you move into reality capture, you can input that information as a flight log. And that flight log uh, will then kind of speed up the alignment process. And you can kind of see here the shutter actuations as we're, we're flying those patterns. And you can see how tight those, those clusters are. Yeah, and basically uh, that GPS information is also forming these camera rigs. So as you can see, these camera positions are um, kind of tied together and they are really accurate. So that is what the accurate GPS information is doing with alignment. So not just increasing speed, but also the accuracy of the whole data set. And how photogrammetry works is that you want this to have um, done before, so during the LN phase. You can't really make mesh uh, more accurate in meshing phase. You need to make it uh, much more accurate in alignment phase. So that's why you need to um, have this kind of intention and keep that in mind. The, uh, after, after alignment, um, what, what was kind of nice is that we did all, all of the images in one alignment, but then we decided to, to break it up for, for meshing and reconstruction. Uh, into these five buckets. We had five gaming consoles, high-end gaming consoles, and uh, we distributed uh, that, that alignment across all of them. And when we went through the whole process and got it out, because we had it all in that master alignment, uh, all those pieces kind of, the coordinate system snapped them all together and it went in nicely. Yeah, and the reasoning, uh, like why this was split into five parts, they had five machines, as Ryan said, and this is also um, increasing the speed of the whole process. Because if you just calculated a single component or like a single reconstruction region, that would take ages. So now you are five times faster or even more. 
And by faster, those five machines each took one month for this process. Just listen to the way that ground worked. And we only had one crash, so we worked, worked out good. Um, after that, we, we moved on to texturing, and then I was left with this uh, uh, you know, problem of, OK, well, now we've got a 16 billion poly model. We brought it down to nine. I know you mentioned nine before, but it, the, the master was 18 billion. And uh, we had thousands of AK textures. And it's like, well, how do, how do you get them out now? Because I can't, I can't export out, and no DCC is going to accept billions of polys and thousands of AK textures. And so we started uh, just essentially you know, uh, creating boundary boxes and f filtering out. And I was going through this very manual process. And, and Thomas is like, you're, you're crazy. Stop doing that. We're gonna we're gonna help you out with this with this cut by box script. I don't know. Maybe you wanna yeah talk about that. Uh, Isar Volis, I would like to shout out to him. So he's created the script for basically uh, calculation of these smaller regions, and then I tailor tailored the whole pipeline to uh, Ryan's use case because uh, you can basically uh, create certain actions in an automated way, so all are applied per reconstruction region. So you can do something like. Uh, filtering selection of the region, so you are basically just isolating that part, then you can apply textures to it, then export it, or you can do sample processing, basically anything you need. And this is how it actually worked. Uh, we calculated all the smaller reconstruction regions from these five slices, and then applied textures, uh, reprojected, rebaked textures, and exported models. So uh, this is a pretty neat workflow, and um, yeah, I don't want to spoil it, but uh, I have some present uh, when we'll get to the end of the presentation for you. So, yeah, those those scripts were an absolute lifesaver. As you can see, it's just cranking through that. So it's it's nice to not have to do all that manually. That's for sure. Um, so then we, then we were left with these all these parts and all these you know uh, uh, textures, and then it was well, how do we get it into the engine? We've got now a, n a nine billion poly. Uh, count model, all these parts, all these textures. How do we get it in there? We can't just ram it all in at once. Um, obviously, that, that that creates problems. Um, so uh, on the un Unreal side, Simon. Simon. Is there Simon? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Simon created a plugin to Unreal uh, because when you have a bunch of data um, in terms of like meshes, textures, you really can do it like in a manual way, just drag and drop thousands of models to Unreal, and you have nine billions of triangles. You want to automate this. So uh, Simon actually created a really neat plugin to Unreal, which automated all of this. There is even a check where you can enable, like, do you want to create nanite meshes, virtualized textures? And also, uh, this will automatically create a master material, because when you have a bunch of um, models like that, you have a material per part. Uh, so you, if you want to color grade it or do anything with that, you need a master material. So this does it automatically. Yeah, and, and some of those import features are obviously in the in the basic importer, but it, it does allow you to set like an in and an out point. So if you've got hundreds of parts, you can say, okay, ingest these 20 parts, then the next 20, and then save as you go. And I found what, what worked well for us was just, you know, taking small chunks bringing them into the content browser, not doing the nanite conversion at the same time, and just letting it sit in the content browser, saving along the way, bringing in piece by piece by piece until it was all in there, and then doing the same thing to convert to nanite until we finally got everything converted to nanite and uh, saved. And this is the uh, result of it. This is not the footage from the drone, by the way. <laughs> These are 10 square miles, right? So, <laughs> yeah. For the sim, were we, what hardware were we using for the simulator, like the actual jump bay? But what's funny is we use the same computers that we use to process all the data to, to run the jump bays. So, those uh, consisted of uh, 24 core uh, AMD. Uh, thread rippers. I think they're 4.3 gigahertz or something like that. Everything's NVMe. Um, we had uh, 3090s and 256 gigs of RAM in each one of those boxes. No single thing, single 3090. Yeah. And, and what you know, what this is, you know, I wanted to show there was just like that wide vista of the 
you know, wide area and then kind of punch in and, and show the level of detail that we're getting on these rock faces. And that's pretty consistent throughout the whole model that's got some, some nice texel density. So, you know, it turns out like when, when you see, you, you mentioned, well, you might not see all that blurring by, but we have it. And now we can, you know, use this, uh, this level, this asset to, as like a canvas to create other things. So it's, uh, you know, it's one of, the, one of the beauties of it. Some of that's back of brain stuff too, right? Like, and the reason that we want to go for, you know, an authentic simulator and an authentic digital twin of a real location is to accelerate that back of brain stuff, to increase the level of immersion, to make somebody believe that they've actually done something that they would never do in the real world because it's too risky. You know, there's, there's only about a thousand people in the world that are certified to wingsuit base jump. And that number fluctuates because some people don't make it, right? It's somewhere between, you know, I've been told by the pros, it's, it depends on the year. It could be 800 people in the world. It could be 1,200 people in the world. It just depends on, you know, how many people um, have actually gone through all the training to, to be allowed to do that. I'm sure people try to do it without the training, and that's a pretty bad idea. We're going to come back to that in just one wait a second. Minute. Uh, we great like question. Our, our challenge was to bridge the gap between the virtual and the real, right? Uh, we needed to create an, auth an authentic human flight experience that was believable on every single level that you can imagine. And I just want to show you guys one last clip that I really think speaks to the uh, believability of what we all pulled off here. <laughs> Dude, seriously, what the hell is that? <sighs> My heart is pounding. Oh, I would have died, definitely. If this was for real, that was the end of me. Oh, now I get it. <clears throat> Why so few people can do this? It's just like, oh my God. This was the most insane thing I did immersively in my life. I've been doing this for 12 years. This is seriously, this is another level. It's, I have no words, um, no words. Jesus, Oof. this is just insane. Oh my God. I wanna do it again. Yes. Now, I can't say I had that exact same reaction the first time that I jumped. Rodrigo is a very animated individual, but that last line, I want to do it again, is that's exactly what I said the first time that I jumped at the prototype was like, I just wanted to get back up there and do it again. You know, this, this simulator is absolutely incredible. I've been working in this space for a while and I've done a lot of location-based entertainment and virtual reality and by far this is the most immersive thing that I've ever done. And beyond that, it's the most repeatable experience that I've ever uh, been in in my life. I mean, it's like skiing or snowboarding, right? Like you, you find a line, you get down to the bottom of the hill and you just want to get back on the lift and go do it again. And this simulator provokes that same feeling. Like you just want to jump and jump and jump. It's really amazing. Um, the data set that we collected for the simulator isn't just useful in simulation, right? Like we're, we're also pretty deep into exploring like how can these large scale data sets work in VAD or virtual production environments as well? Like imagine being able as a director to say, I want to go five miles that way. And then we don't have to load a whole new scene, right? Like we can just move the world over where it needs to be, line up our new shot. You could amortize the cost of a scan uh, like this to shoot an entire television series or a movie, you know? So we're, we're really excited about that. And then, we wanted yeah, to show you guys like this you other said, clip I mean, here. He, um, he always we've used photogrammetry for several years for Red Bull Rampage. Um, here, this is an uh, example of what we did a couple of well, last year for the broadcast, at, uh, actually. Uh, we, the we did this scan from a drone, and um, Rampage is largely considered like the Super Bowl of mountain biking. And the biggest challenge of Rampage is giving the people at home context as to you know how terrifying these courses are. And 
it was always a challenge uh, for that to translate on screen with a flat camera. So when we first started scanning uh, the Rampage Mountains over the years, the director of the show would come up to Ryan and I after, and like, he gave us a hug the first year, and he's like, you gave me a tool that I've never had before that gave me context, context to give direction to the camera operators that I've never been able to do before. So we've proven out that, you know, the same methodology of capturing a location, we can use it not only in simulation, but we can use it in broadcast television, commercials, TV, uh, film. In camera VFX. Yeah, in camera VFX, all sorts of stuff. We also, you know, recognize that, you know, like, it's it's not for everybody. It's it you know the optimizing these massive levels and like getting them into a game is, you know, for us difficult. If anyone knows how to do that, I'd love to, I'd love to talk. So, but you know, if you're hardwired, location based entertainment, any of these LED walls, like metaverse activations and streaming, um, I think there's there's a lot of potential. But yeah, just wanted. And now to the question. So um, th there's the present. Um, if you basically scan the QR code, uh, that will guide you to a survey. And uh, if you're interested in trying out the whole workflow yourself, so uh, basically getting the CLI script, beta version of reality capture, and the photogrammetry input utility widget for Unreal, uh, we'll send you over in a number of weeks uh, the whole like guide documentation and all of this. Uh, once again, thank you to Ryan, Tomas, and uh, Joe. It's been a great presentation. And they are sticking around. So if you do want to talk to them, grab them when they jump off stage. Thank you, everyone.